New AI models keep popping up, making us wonder whether we're going to be suffering AI overload sometime soon. Also, the self-driving car movement appears to be broken down on the side of the road. We're going to discuss these tech stories and more on this episode of Today in Tech. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. The guy behind the monitors is Chris. Hello, sir. Hey, how's it going? Going well. And uh, joining us today for his final guest co-host appearance, at least for now, is Jack Gold. Jack is the principal analyst at J. Gold Associates. Hello, Jack. Keith and Chris, how are you guys doing? Good. It's, it, it feels like it's your, your graduation day. This is your last one, but don't, <laughs> don't, don't get senioritis and, and, and kind of blow off this episode, okay? We want your best stuff it's, this it's, week. It's, it's not a layoff notice, right? No, 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 no. We just we just figure that our guest co-hosts should get breaks every <laughs> while, every now and then, so that they don't start saying the same things over and over again, and we get uh, some fresh blood in here. So um, that's 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 part of the deal. Uh, no problem. As long as it's not a, a pink background, I'm good. There you go. There you go. And um and and we'll definitely have you back. I'm, I'm sure very soon. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So at, at, as we noted at the end of last week's episode, the red team won the Super Bowl. So I'm, I'm very happy that we were able to predict that. Um, uh, but from the Super Bowl, there were some there were a lot of ads that uh, that AI companies had had uh, put out. And so uh, there's an article in CNBC this uh, last week where basically it was talking about that the way that AI is going to be sold to a skeptical public is now starting to become clear and they're using the backdrop of the Super Bowl to discuss that you know you've got a lot of people that are out there that are worried about AI and so a lot of the ads that we're talking about that that you know they paid 7 million dollars for the Super Bowl ad again reaching a broad audience there's no other broader audience than the Super Bowl it's where you have 123 million live viewers watching something um, and so they they went through a lot of the ads and said this is how AI is going to be kind of promoted and marketed. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to ask you guys about some of the ads that that, that showed that, that appeared and, and what your thoughts were on them. Um, the first one was from Microsoft talking about the Copilot AI Assistant. And this is their app that that basically acts like, and, and I keep calling it Clippy 2.0, and that's probably not fair. But, um, you know, it, it showed a bunch of people, and, and most of them were young looking, and they were all like, you know, people keep telling me I can't do stuff, I won't get my degree, I won't start that business, uh, in all this stuff. And then um, then it says, well, you can with, with this kind of AI uh, tool. And, and they showed, you know, it was writing and some, you know, images and things like that. Um, what were your thoughts of, of how Microsoft presented its vision of AI, Jack? Um, very futuristic. Look, AI, and we talked about this before on the show, right? AI, I consider, is, a, is, is an assistant intelligence, not an artificial intelligence. It's there to help you get things done. Yeah. And so from a co-pilot perspective, from a Microsoft soft perspective, what they really want to do is they want it to sit there in background, find out what you're doing and give you suggestions on how to do it better, whether that's studying or whether that's, you know, writing the next uh, great novel uh, or whether it's creating PowerPoints. That's kind of where they're trying to take Copilot. And, and from a user perspective, that makes a lot of sense because it's not really replacing me so much as yeah. it is helping me do it right. Yeah. And, and it, Go ahead. I, I'm sorry. So I, I guess the final thought I was had was, we, you know, we've been through this before. The biggest one, I mean, it's now been several decades, but the biggest one was Google search. Remember, I'm an old guy. I remember when I was in school, I had to go to the library to write reports and look at the Encyclopedia Britannica, right? Do you remember now, the Dewey Decimal System? Uh, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Now it's probably Dewey binary, but okay, it's it's but but they it's out there. They didn't have like Google search didn't you didn't there was never a, a feeling that Google and search was going to replace a job though, right? Right. Well, no. Well, unless you were a librarian, <laughs> that's true. I mean, you know, honestly, yeah. Uh, no, it just made your life easier, but it made made you able to get access to information quickly. Okay, and relevant information well not always relevant i mean google search isn't always the greatest at giving you what you need right it's, right sometimes you have to drill down 12 pages to get to what you're looking for uh but it got better over time got better over the years uh and it really changed the way people work 
not right. just not just work uh, w- w- the way kids communicate right or or the way uh, social media works I mean it's all about search and so AI is really I'd say probably search especially gen gen AI is search 2.0 or th- maybe 3.0 right uh, mm-hmm. it, it's just it, it's that kind of change at least within yeah at least in, in terms of finding accurate information it, the creativity part of it I think too I think Microsoft did a good job there in showing the ability to create artificial intelligent images and things that might be popping out of the brain um, for p- people that might want to start their own business and they're looking for a logo or, you know, they don't have those necessarily creative artistic skills, but then can jumpstart it from there. Um, right. So I, I, I just noted that most I just noted that most of those people in that ad were young people and like they, uh, they should have thrown some yeah. old people in I, there. I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of torn. Uh, with the ad, I, I I don't think it's I uh, I don't think it's I think it's aimed to be uh, inspirational, but it, I I wasn't okay, necessarily here's the thing. inspired it's, by it. It's it's trying to be inspirational, you know. It's saying you know, hey, I'll never open my own business, you know, like hey, they say I won't be able to do it, or you know, or get my degree, you know, what we're seeing here, or you know, um. Let me see what else it's saying. They say I'll never make my movie, and it's like. <laughs> It's okay. Oh, okay. They'll, they'll say, I'll never do this. I'll never do that. Unless I use this AI to do the, the some of it for me. I, I don't like, well, I think again, it's again, not, I, think I don't think it's hitting the mark. You no, know, your generation yet. and my generation and Jack's generation were all like, it, it come, do you think it comes off a little whiny then? A little bit, it, maybe, a, little, okay. a little bit because like, I mean, it's supposed to be inspiring to those young people, I guess, to that generation. So it's not speaking to us. Like I remember, I don't know what grade it was in, in, in math class. We weren't allowed calculators. We had to shore work and stuff like that. And it's kind of like, you're kind of, we're kind of like telling the generation now, like, hey, if you want to start your business or hey, if you want to get your degree or hey, if you want to exceed, succeed and do this and yeah. overcome your challenges, use this AI and it'll, you know, it'll do some of it for you. I'm just like, uh, I, I don't think that's the right approach. I don't think that's the right approach for, 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 you know, well. for the ad or to tell younger generations. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, Maybe I'm being a, a little too strict on this, but I, I don't know. I, I think it, it would be more inspirational if they said something to the effect of, hey, there's technology out there now that can help you exactly. achieve your goals and dreams without, ha- without coming off as, as a little whiny. Exactly. Like, like the AI is there to help you. If you, need, if you yeah. need that little helping hand, you know, if you need that little pat on the shoulder, be like, hey, no, do it like this or try it like that. You okay. know what I mean? But. All right. Yeah. AI could be a mentor. Yeah, if, AI if it's can a mentor, be your mentor. It helps you. Right. Yeah. And it's good. Right. Yeah. There right. you go. Okay. Like again, sky's the limit. Don't be don't be don't be limited by what you think you might have the skills for. You can get them through technology. It's more of a technology optimism rather than just a helping hand up or replacement for something else. Right. It's like it's like it's like saying like, "Hey, you know, they said I'd never write my book." But watch me. I'm going to use AI to write it for me. There we go. So AI becomes your ghostwriter. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, AI should just be able to tell me if my book stinks or not. <laughs> like, anyway, anyway. Oh, well, so I want to move on to some of the other ads. The um, I don't know if you could bring up this one, Chris, at the Etsy ad. Um, this was, yeah, it, it was in that paragraph where it, it kind of runs through the, the ones that Oh, the other, okay. Yeah, the other ads. Um, da, 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 da. It was like... Etsy, right here. Yeah. Okay, let's take a uh, look. Click the next one. No, nope, that's just the regular one. <laughs> click the next link. I think that's the one where... It, oh, help find the perfect present. Yeah. So this was this was an ad where uh, it was more comical, where it's like um, the people in the U.S. Are, are... They've just received the Statue of Liberty from France. And someone goes, oh, geez, now we got to get France a gift. So they didn't know what to do, so they they popped on their cell phone and found this Etsy gift uh, gift mode idea. That, so this is something that the Etsy app is now, where it suggests a gift for you. And so the guy pushes the button, and you know someone says, oh, they love cheese. And so it, it, it suggests a cheese board for France. Kind of a goofy, dumb ad. Um, I, right. And I'm not sure whether or not it, it really, you know, again... Etsy is now saying, all right, well, we have AI that can help pick uh, the right item within Etsy if you don't know what to get someone. Um, and again, replacing the idea of search 
where when I go to Etsy, I might type in, oh, look for something with a Super Mario theme or something like that. And, and, so then, and then a hat comes up that someone has quilted. Um, and that's kind of yeah. the Etsy the situation. I, I just don't think this one is as effective. I mean, it's 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 I, I don't like like forced humor in the in my Super Bowl ad. So that that that, that kind of that didn't do it for me. But I'm not sure if people are going to jump over to Etsy and say, oh, I need a computer to help me pick out a gift. Gifting is supposed to be right. personal, right? All right. Well, I think what they're trying to do and I agree with you, I didn't like the ad either. But I think what they were trying to do is say, look. We've got this AI assistant back there who's your concierge, right? Uh, it knows what you need to do. Uh, look, <laughs> if I were French sending over the Eiffel Tower, which cost you know hundred million dollars, <laughs> statue liberty, and statue twenty dollar cheese board, yeah. I, I'd be pretty pissed, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Like and, and again, uh, it, it it hits on these these French stereotypes and tropes. It's like you know, oh, the French love cheese, and oh, and, and there's a mime in it. And it's like, okay, well, it fell uh, short. Like, there's got to be a better way to advertise. Um, the ability to give a gift to someone better than this, this, this France America thing. In fact, I'm going to come up with it right now. My kids hate getting gifts for me because every time they get a gift for me, it's usually something I don't like. <laughs> I'm just thinking in my head, sorry, is there a better way to show that you're lazy and you cannot <laughs> do things on your own and you have to... <laughs> Someone no, should have made an ad on that. Come well, on. No, no, but <laughs> see, on. if Etsy came out and said to... to it did an ad where it's like a, a grumpy old man like me or, you know, some middle-aged dad who, you know, he's like, oh, I got another tie. Oh, I got another golf shirt. And, you know, or things that, that are typical gifts that you give dads. And then, you know, and then popping it up to Etsy is like, well, I know he likes Super Mario Brothers. And then, you know, wow, this really cool Super Mario hat comes up. Like, wouldn't that be a better way of explaining what this AI can do than what they did? Well, in fact, they, Etsy's had better ads, just like you said, before they even talked about the AI stuff. I remember seeing Etsy ads over the last few weeks where they talk about, I think a woman's dad was a uh, avid golfer or something, and she was looking for a unique gift. Yeah. And she found him something. Right. Right. But but through yeah, but through the AI. search, right? But just yeah. through regular search. Right. Right. So, what that shows to me is that the AI is actually a step back. Right. Uh, I. I. I I don't know who their creative agency is, but they probably need a new one. Yeah, I, I like I like even Chris's idea of of suggesting like, all right, listen, and and maybe maybe they gear this one towards men, and they go, all right, we know you're too lazy to buy your wife a nice gift, so use AI, use use AI, <laughs> you know, answer these three questions about about your wife, and we'll pick out the perfect gift for you, or something right. like that, and then and then it's more like a concierge, like you were saying, right, right, Jack, right, right. Like, I agree, all right. Uh, the, the next one I want to talk now, this is the one I did like. This was the uh, Google guided frame uh, for the Google Pixel. Chris, it, it's... Yeah. So it's one who, so that helps those who are visually yes. impaired? Yes, and this okay. was very powerful. I, I really liked this ad um, because it showed, it showed someone who, is, um, uh, vis who has some visual impairments, uh, blindness or low vision. And so they show you what generally they see. And so then he holds up a phone and then there's this voice command and then it takes a picture. So it, it basically directs the guy to take a, 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 a selfie of himself um, and then it recognizes the dog. It recog you know, and so it's just it's, it's a very powerful commercial. Um, and, I, and I think it, it worked here. And again, it, it doesn't necessarily put AI in the forefront. But you understand that AI is at work here through, and then again, great images, great video, um, and, and it tells a great story. So, you know, Jack, did, yeah. did you get the same the same thoughts from this? I, I yeah. like the commercial. Yeah. Uh, the the I had I had one small uh, exception to liking the commercial, and that is that they didn't set it up properly. I mean, when you first see the commercial, everything's a blur and you don't know what's going on. So yeah. it took a while to get into it. Yeah. And I have a problem with that. But but other than that, what they were showing was AI actually on their device. It was on the phone. Yeah. It's not going into the cloud. And it was telling the, the, the fellow that, that couldn't see very well, you know, move left, move right. It's not centered properly. The focus is off. Perfect. Right. That's what you want in AI. That's what you want an assistant intelligence to, to help you with. 
So that was a great commercial, in my opinion, other than they were trying to sell their Pixel phones, sure. of course. Yeah, and, and again, still. and again, this is <laughs> this is the cynical side of me. Um, now, Chris has a Google Pixel, so he's a fan. So he he might eventually get one of these once he once his five year uh, phone cycle is up. Um, he'll he'll get one of these features. But I'm thinking I I like I liked the technology behind it, and I can't wait for Apple to put it on their phone, and then I'll have it. Which again. So does that really mean it's a success for for Google? Because they're not going to get me to switch. It'll it'll be a success for Google once Apple <laughs> puts <laughs> it on their phone, and then they claim that they, and then they, they claim they invented the it. Right, right, right. But anyway, that's that's what a good Super Bowl ad should do. It should it should tell a story. It should it should it should make you feel good. You yep. understand the technology. Um, so thumbs up to Google. And then the last one uh, was CrowdStrike, and they were using AI in the, their cyber attacks. Um, so they were, this was a Western scene. It was a, you know, it's a world now where it's, it's a Western, uh, trope and the people are also robots for some reason. It's like cyberpunk Western. Yeah. I don't understand why the, the bad guys were robots, but the good guys are robots too. And, and very confusing for me in terms of what, what am I doing here? Other than the, the hero comes in and, and rescues everybody through its AI, um, cyber attack protection service or whatever um so i don't think this this didn't do it for me either jack what, what did you think yeah i it didn't do it for me it was hard for the average person to understand what was going on yeah again. um and uh you know it was a little too fut- futuristic with the, all the robots the other thing that it, the reason it doesn't do it for me maybe i know too much about this stuff is right the bad guys are also using ai Right. And so yeah. it's a battle of good AI versus bad AI. Right. And and they didn't show that at all. So it, yeah, um, and, and also you think like and again, I, it's hard for a security company to um prom, to make ads like this to a general audience. I think most people could care less about what security firm, you know, it's 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 usually the IT guys in the security department that need to have this stuff. And so like $7 million for a Super Bowl ad for for this where you're where, you know, 80% of your people watching this or even higher aren't, aren't going to care, right? They're not going to remember what yeah. security company you have at your you know, at your company. Yeah, I feel like most people don't know what cybersecurity is in general. <laughs> and that's obvious because so many of them are failing at it. Like, yeah, but uh, I mean, I think it's it's tough to kind of like show security in an entertaining way. So I can understand why they went this route. I mean, I think it's all right, but I think only the people in this in the you know IT cybersecurity realm are going to know what they're watching here once right. they see the woman come out with the the red hat, red scarf, and stuff. Yeah, I, I I don't know. Again, I think it's another thing where the agency probably had this grand idea and it just didn't it just didn't work. Um, yeah. But again, that's. And it, and it, and at $7 million, think of how many pizzas their employees aren't going to be able to eat over the next year. Oh, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> $7 million, jeez. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't, I don't no think you have... The, oh, go ahead, Jack. No, I was going to say, no more free pizzas for months. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a shame. It's, 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 yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. No pizza for... I'd rather have the pizza, <laughs> I think. Um, there was an ad for uh, Despicable Me 4, which is the uh, an animated movie that's coming out. Um, I don't think this is on the list, uh, okay. Chris, but but this ad, it was basically, sh- they're promoting the movie, um, but it, it starts out with a voiceover guy, and he's talking about AI is about to change the world, and um, they start showing you funny images that ChatGPT has created, or some of this AI has created. Um, you know, people with 17 fingers, uh, you know, people, people, you know, eating like hard pasta instead of regular pasta. And, and then at the end, it's all the minions and the minions are basically the ones that are drawing the, these images. Um, again, a funny way of showing some of the failures of, of, uh, AI generation, uh, image generation. And then of course, then they were like, okay, and then go watch this movie. Um, so I thought that was cute. I thought that was a good way of, of explaining some of the problems that AI has. So I don't know if you saw that as well, Jack. Yeah, I did. Actually, yeah. I must have missed that one. You know, the dog had to go out. So yeah, it could have been like a lot of these Super Bowl ads. Like they, sometimes they put them before the show or before the the show before the yeah. the event. Um, so sometimes you miss them. And again, Super Bowl halftime show. Maybe you're in the bathroom or you miss miss one of them. But they're all on YouTube. So like you could always just find all of these. Not only. Yeah. 
after the the uh, the game, but you can you can actually most of them get put up before uh, the week before. Now sometimes they're they're yeah. doing some stuff. Uh, okay, totally off the subject, but you know do you know how people know it's halftime? How the water, water pressure, pressure goes down. Yeah, water pressure goes down dramatically <laughs> as everyone's going to the bathroom. Right, right. That was the plot of an animated movie, by the way. I don't know if you knew if you. The, I don't remember that one. Okay, there was an animated movie. Uh, I think it was called <laughs> Flushed Away, and it was by the people that did Wallace and Gromit. So it was it was a uh-huh. it was over in England, and the plot it was all a bunch of rats living in this sewer system, and. The bad guys had figured out that during the World Cup game, again, foot, you know, English football or, or soccer, um, they figured out that the water pressure would drop so much at some point, and that would allow them to do this big heist that they had planned because all the water was going to go down. And so the good guy had to figure out how to, like, prevent that from happening. I, again, that, that's in this part of my brain where I can remember this, but I can't remember what, what I was looking for when I walk into a room. So. Uh, all right, right. I want to move on to love Wallace and Grimm. Yeah, um, I want to move on to the next one. Uh, this is another AI story that, that just came out. So, just two months after Google launched Gemini, uh, Google is now basically announcing its successor. It launched Gemini 1.5 today, making it available to developers and enterprise users ahead of a full consumer rollout coming soon. Company made clear that it is all in on Gem- Gemini as a business tool, a personal assistant, and everything in between, and it's pushing hard on that plan. So there's a bunch of things that, that this one will have, including this description on this Verge article of this like gigantic context window um, that, that can basically remember everything that's ever been written and, and, and all this other stuff. The reason I wanted to talk about this is, is do we feel like as these new models keep rolling out and we get a new version and, and, and another company makes a, an announcement, it feels like, A, I'm falling behind in, in figuring out who has what. Uh, But then secondly, I'm starting to get the sense of there's AI overload. And um, I can only if if I'm feeling this just as the host of a podcast, I'm wondering if business leaders are also struggling with trying to figure out what might be right for their business. And then and then on the consumer side, it's like, well, you know, there's 17 different things I've got to try now. Like, is it the Microsoft one? Is it going to be the Google one? Do I do I go with OpenAI? They don't even have to advertise. Um, you know, for the people that know it, you know, do I go to this mid journey tool to draw things? Do I go to Bing edge? Like, am I, am I right to assume that we're starting to get this overload of, of things flying at me AI wise? Well, everybody's got an AI message right now, right? If you're in business, you're inundated with people with ads and we're AI powered, even if they're not right, we're AI powered, everything's AI powered, but you're right from a business perspective. Um, it's tough because these things change dramatically uh, over a three or six month period. And part of it has to do with just the fact that it takes a little longer, maybe every year or two, we're getting huge advances in compute power. Yeah. And a lot of these new models take an awful lot of processing power. Um, and it's not just NVIDIA, you know, with these big super monster computers that, you know, take up city block and need a nuclear power plant next to them to power them. It's also AI is coming to your device. It's already on phones. It's going to be in your PC this year. Uh, it's going to be in your car in the not the distant future. Uh, and so the question then becomes, do I have to go out and pick AI or do I just say, yeah, okay, it's there. It's transparent. I don't really care. If you're a business user and you're building an app around it, you need to, you need to pick one. Right. And you need to pick one and stay with it because you can't change it every three months. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. But I, if you're I, a consumer, Ultimately, it's going to fade to the background. You're probably not even going to know. I, I think from an end user perspective, from the consumer side, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this onslaught of things and going, I, you know, I, I guess it's nice to have, but I'm not going to necessarily change my habits to, to get it. It's a lot like... Or pay for it. Yeah, it, it's a lot like when the, a new phone comes out. So Apple comes out and they make a big announcement or, or Google or Samsung and they, they have a, you know, and, and you watch the keynote and they go, here are 12 different awesome new things that you can do with this phone. And, and they run through it and then you just go to, you know, and, and I don't necessarily remember everything that, that Apple has put in the iOS. And it's not until um, 
two or three iterations later, like maybe there's an iOS update or my kids start using something and then and then I realize that I have that on my phone, like the like the whole stickers thing with messages. Um, my kids finally started using stickers and now I finally got the OS update where I could take a picture and it creates a sticker out of it. Uh, this is a bad example, but that's an... But, so I don't pay attention, like I, I pay attention at the keynote time, but then I never know if I'm actually going to use it at some point. And I think that it's the same way with AI. It's like, here's seven different AI things. And then maybe at some point it'll show up in my, in my browser or in, I'll remember it's like, oh yeah, I can do this if I need to. Yeah. Well, it, it's not just an AI. Look, m most people have two or 300 apps on their smartphones. They use 10 regularly. Yeah maybe 20, whatever the number is, right? The rest just sit there in the background and you never touch them. Um, so it, it, it's just overload. You can't work with all of the functions and all of the capabilities probably that it's going to provide to you. You're going to pick a few that work for you and that's what you're going to use. And everyone, the reason there are so many is because everyone's a little bit different, right? You need, you, you may like pizza and I may like hamburgers, you know, <laughs> uh, whatever. Um, it, it, that's what they're, they're trying to, do with having this being so broad yeah. same thing with ios you know you brought up brought up ios they've got all these functions you'll use 10 that you like i happen to be an android guy but i'll use 10 that i'm an android that i like sure and you know chris will pick another 20 that he likes right um but they may not be the same I, i'm just thinking that there's a danger at some point if you're a company and you spend a lot of money um with microsoft or with google uh, and you and you roll out all of these features and it's and it's X dollars per month per licensed user. Uh, right. And then you start forcing your users or your employees to start using this stuff. And the employees are going to be like, no, I, I don't want to use this at all. Well, I, I, yeah, I, go ahead. I wonder, like, if all these companies are going to kind of embed AI into their products. It just makes me wonder, like, what the what the security yes. perspective is going to be around this. You know, are they going to have to make this AI lo only local to your devices? Is this is the AI going to constantly be hooked up to the cloud? Like, that's what I'd be kind of asking. If all these companies are rolling out AI, it's like, geez. Yeah, what's your security? Yeah, and I can tell you now that their their security profile is probably not what you as an end user would want or... Even as a company, you don't want that data to get leaked out into the into the training set. Yeah, I, I have a feeling yeah. it's just going to be well, just one of those features. Let, let's let's use the you know, like our phone as an example. It's probably just going to be a feature I'm not going to use. For example, if you look at basically every phone that comes out, you know how you can embed your credit card information. Right into the uh, so, RFID thing on, right, your, on your right. phone, so, right? Yeah, I can like Apple Pay. I can put it in. I, I am in never going to do that because that is just <laughs> silly. Right. Like if your stone, if your phone gets stolen, then you you have all the information on that chip in your phone. Well, you better hope that you've been enabled the uh, the biometrics on it so that right, they right. Can't get but into still, the phone. you know what I mean? It's just, I'm, I, it just makes me wonder. Makes me wonder what they're going to do. Yeah. Jack, any, any thoughts on the security side of things? Is, are, we, are we worrying too much because we see all of these stories about privacy and data and hacks and things like that? And maybe the average user doesn't... Because I'm just seeing it as another vulnerability. Yeah. It's just another vulnerability. You know what I mean? Well, you're, you're, you're paranoid about a lot of things, Chris. I am. <laughs> For you, Chris. You should be. Good. Jack's no, look, on your I, side. I, you know, you talk from the, about the security issues, and one of the issues that people aren't addressing... Uh, is the fact that AI is a double-edged sword. Everything that you can do to make it better, for your life better with AI, I can do as a bad guy to try to imitate your life and steal your identity and money and car and, or, you know, whatever else, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not just, and I know you got the story coming up, we can talk about it in, in a second, but it's not just the good stuff that AI does. It can also do bad stuff for us. All right, I wasn't going to talk about it, but since you brought it up, I, w I want to. Now, Chris, you don't have you don't have, you don't have the URL on this, but um, is this the the dead children one? Yeah, yeah. All right, so there was a, there was a Wall Street Journal story out this week uh, where um, uh, there's an advocacy company. There's an There's a company that's trying to advocate for gun control, and what they did was they used uh, Eleven Labs, the voice AI. Uh, abilities to imitate the someone's voice and they recreated voices of some of the kids that were killed in the parkland shooting jeez and and again i don't want to bring i don't want to talk about it from the gun control 
aspect or the political aspect of it. Um, the article was trying to point out, is this a good use of AI? Um, and, and, but even then, it's still a gray area because you start getting into discussions of, of uh, who has the right to someone's likeness after they die. Now, we've seen celebrities go through this. And, and again, that was a big issue with um, uh, way back in the days when they were using Fred Astaire's images to sell vacuum cleaners and things like that. Estates usually have yeah. that now built into the, the, their wills of, all right, you can't use my images, you can't use my likeness unless, unless we get some money for that usage. Um, and then even with voice AI, uh, some people were imitating George Carlin's voice. Uh, to create a new, uh, like, hey, what if George Carlin was alive today? Would it, w- this co- this comedic attempt? This is the first one where I've seen it where they're using it for political purposes. Um, and again, as a parent, if 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 one of my kids, uh, God forbid, like you know, lost their life, do I have the right as a parent to then use that likeness to then try to to gain political points uh, or make a point for gun control later? I certainly don't want my my likeness and my voice or my images to try to either sell something or have something that I'm not saying right now, uh, you know, in the future after I go. So this is, this is why it's disturbing to me, but also I understand their perspective. So Jack, I don't, it feels like you have some thoughts on this too. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and, and this is a, this is an issue of rights, right? Copyrights or, or personal rights. Um, AI. And, and, and by the way, this is why chat GPT is getting sued, Right because they're going out on the internet and sucking in everything they possibly can, including copyrighted materials, and putting it into the models, which then you, you and I can, can use AI to search. Right. Um, and is that right? You know, if you spent uh, a year writing a new novel and they just kind of, and somehow it's on the internet and they suck in all that data and then use it is, and without any compensation or, or, or better, even your permission, is that right? And I would argue the, the answer is no. But that's copyright law that's going to get resolved over the next, who knows, year or two years. Right, right. The it, yeah, there's a lot of lawsuits around that space. Um, but this is something more right. than just copyright. This, no, this, this feels different. It's personal. It, yeah. It, do you own your own voice or your own image or your own body? I, I absolutely agree with you. And right now, I don't know that there's any law that they're breaking by doing that. I, there might be. I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. But But clearly... It is an issue. Uh, you know, deep fakes are a big issue. Yeah, yeah. I could, with the right AI program, I could make you say anything. Right, and that's what concerns me now, is I don't want someone to come in and, and present, you know, like, for example, um, if I'm gone and then someone takes my voice and my image and they go, and, and they go oh, well, we'll use them in a Microsoft ad where, I, where we can get them to say, Microsoft is the greatest company in the history of the world, if I was famous. Yeah. Again, it, again, I don't, I'm not too worried about it because um, I, I don't think I'm going to reach the level of fame where Microsoft's going to want to uh, fake my voice or anything like that. But um, y- yeah, and, I, and I've talked about this on the show before where, you know, again, I, I lost my father 20-something years ago. Um, I wish I had more recordings of him because then I would be like, well, would I, would I use the recordings that I had of him to recreate the, you know, him talking to me or, or just being able to hear his voice again? Uh, I, that's a very powerful type of thing. Even within this story that the wall street journal had was, you know, when the parents heard their, their children talking to them again, um, it, it got very emotional and got very, you know, it, it was a deep, deep message. It was positive for them, but it was also very, you know, uh, heartrending. And, and, and right. you know, we, we had a guy on that was doing this. There, there's a company in South Korea that allows you to record yourself so that when you pass away, your loved ones can talk to you. Your image. Um, their, your like a holographic image, yeah. image of you and, and with your voice and everything like that. And again, I'm, 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 I'm still balancing the, the good versus the bad on this so um this was this was interesting and but yet still disturbing and i'm like i i just don't know if the world is ready for this yet it's early days right yeah you don't have a lot of this but i'm sure this is going to end up in court yeah but but this was it's all a- done this was all done with the permission of the parents 
So yeah, so that's different, right? If you have permission, then that's you know that changes the, the equation dramatically. Right. The the more uh, troubling aspect, and we talked about this last time or the time before, about yeah. you know the Biden voice calls uh, calls to New Hampshire during the primaries. And those have that's been, a whole right. different ballgame. And then the FCC has basically banned that anyway. Um, so now you can now you've got a little bit of teeth to try to go and find these companies if if they're doing that. Um, I, I just think that this is going to be something like, have you thought about it? Like, do you want your image and and, and audio uh, used by your family members at some point, whether it's to just talk to you in the future or maybe sell something or. <laughs> I, I look, I'd be less you, concerned if it was with my media family. Yeah. You know, because it's a media family, you know, they can do whatever. If someone's using my image to try, I don't know, promote something, I don't know what they promote. I'm not that famous either. But, yeah. um, you know, if you're Tom Brady or Taylor Swift, right, or, or Kelsey or, you know, whoever, yeah, um, Holmes, then, yeah, that's a real concern. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think definitely. I th- but I also think people should should start thinking about that, if, even if they're not famous. Uh, yeah. Just to just to try to protect themselves at some point, because who knows what what they what you might be used for in the future. Uh, I wanted to jump to the next story. This is um, now this is right up your alley, Jack. I know you cover a lot of uh, CPU and GPU stuff, but um, Nvidia this week unveiled its RTX 2008 generation GPU, a GPU, a graphics processing unit designed to meet the demands of AI accelerated design and visualization. This is all tied in as as more and more AI stuff comes out, you're going to need a lot more processing power. Um, this has 19.9 billion transistors in it, and uh, basically, Nvidia is now saying it's 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 got better performance, versatility, AI capabilities, uh, propose, positioning it as a solution for professionals in various fields. Was it is this a big deal or is this just another uh, in, Nvidia announcement? Like, what did you what did you yeah. when you saw this? What did I you don't think? think it's I don't think it's that big of a deal. Okay, it's the <laughs> next generation. Well, honestly, it's a next generation GPU. GPUs are used in AI. Uh, but this is really geared more towards personal use. It's geared more towards, you know, sticking it into a, a desktop PC and, and being able to run AI locally. And that's all well and good. Uh, we're going to see, it, within two years, you're going to see pretty much every PC that you can pos- that you can buy out there, at a reasonable cost at least, have some level of AI acceleration built in. Whether it's an individual card like the NVIDIA when they're talking about here, or whether it's you know built on into a, an Intel or AMD chip, they're they're all going to have that stuff built in. So, and and the number of transistors is yeah, it's not that impressive. There are chips out there that have you know fifty billion, eighty billion transistors in them already. So, um, it's it's big, but it's not it's not big by a lot of standards. Does this indicate that AI processing will now be done on edge devices, whether it's a, your local yeah. computer? And so th- is there any value for AI stuff to remain in the cloud? Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and so here's the division. Um, it, it's not, it's not a, a, an easy division to make, but, but here's what's going to happen uh, if we look out in the uh, next couple of years. This is very similar to what used to happen in the graphics market. Remember 10 years ago, if you wanted a, wanted to play games on a, a computer, you had to go out and buy a real heavy-duty GPU. Yep. Today, you can do that on a, an, an embedded CPU from Intel or AMD. It's not exactly the same, but you can get most of it done. The same is going to happen in AI. And, and so what's going to happen is you're going to be doing a lot of processing locally on your machine, particularly around the data sets that you've already got. Look, we've already got multi-gigabytes worth of data on our machines that I would love to be able to search because right now I don't know where I have put half my files, right? <laughs> All right. So you will get that, and, and Microsoft's going to build that into the OS. But there will also be really big problems that will have to go off to a data center somewhere okay. uh, in the cloud. And, and and it's also important to note that there is a difference. AI isn't one thing. There is an inference, and there's machine learning. Machine learning is training a model, giving it lots and lots and lots and lots of data, and then training it. Inference means I've already built the model. I can then make that fairly small and run it almost anywhere on almost any chip. And so you're going to be doing inference pretty much at the edge, whether that's on your own device or whether it's going to be in your car or whether it's going to be a small uh, uh, server-like device in a, in a cell tower. Uh, so it's all going to move in that direction. So AI is going to be pretty much anywhere, and it'll fade into the background. Okay. Yeah, and, and NVIDIA also then, uh, there was another article that um, was on, I think it was on The Verge, where 
they were releasing an early version of chat with our RTX today, which is a demo app that lets you run a personal AI chatbot on the PC. You can feed it YouTube videos and your own documents to create summaries and get relevant answers based on your own data. Uh, it basically runs locally on a PC, and all you need is like a uh, RTX 30 or 40 series GPU with at least 8 gigabytes of VRAM. So I, I just thought it was interesting from the use case scenario of being able to summarize YouTube videos really quickly. Um, that's yeah. Again, that's useful for someone like me who has to ingest a lot of data to try to find yeah. some, some, some topics to talk about. Um, so, yeah, and, that, and, and that's the edge model. That's the inference model that I talked about earlier. It, it, right. It's running stuff on your device. Okay. So, I mean, but how earth shattering is this going to be? Is this, most people won't even know it and the, or is it going to be like, they'll, they'll have to go out and seek this stuff. No, it'll be, it'll be on your machine. It'll be part <laughs> of the, op it makes, it will eventually make its way into your OS, whether it's Apple or whether it's Microsoft. And it'll be it'll one of those things where they announce it. And then three years later, I try to remember that I have it. And then, <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Hey, we're on a sports theme anyway, so let's go to the next story. Uh, this was um, this was weird. This this was on CNN. Uh, was it CNN? No, maybe Hollywood Reporter. Um, apparently, you know, no, no. This was the CNN. Amazon landed the rights to exclusively stream one NFL playoff game next season on its Prime Video platform. Uh, and this is a, a, according to a report in CNN. Uh, the deal comes less than a month after NBC Universal's Peacock became the first ever platform to exclusively live stream an, an NFL playoff game. Uh, and we talked about that on the show when it happened. So again, I, I, I like showing um, an evolution of, okay, you've got here, and then uh, you know you see the roll the ball rolling down the hill. We're going you know now now Amazon's gonna jump in. And so now, if you want to watch any, all of the playoff games, you're gonna have to have like, you know, broadcast cable to watch this game or this streaming service to watch this one. I mean, we're already there anyway with the regular season, but you would think that the playoffs would be like, well, we'll just let everybody watch the playoffs. Um, I, I yeah. don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not excited about this news. Uh, look, I think it's a pendulum, right? The pendulum starting to swing to if you want to watch sports. Look, football is the most popular sport in America, right? By by wide margin, right? Uh, if you and now what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, okay, we want you to pay more to watch it. And so the pendulum swinging towards pay per game kind of viewing. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if people aren't going to pay, then the viewership's going to drop and the ad revenues are going to go down the toilet. Right. And so I think if you look out a couple of years from now, this is experimental. I think a couple of years from now, you're going to see it swing back. Yeah. I, I think they're going to just say, Let's put it out there for anybody who wants to watch it, and we'll just make it up on the commercial. There was a good uh, opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal that was talking about the uh, that mega sports service that we talked about on last week's show. And, uh, you know, we were saying that, well, this could mean the, the end of cable and, you know, the people that were hanging on to cable because of the sports packages um, would, would migrate to this one. But he was saying that, he goes, there's just not enough interest in sports to kind of dedicate towards a service like that. Because again, if you, if, for example, so I live in the Boston area. Um, I just want to, for, for basketball purposes, I just want to watch Celtics games. And I could subscribe to a service that, that gives me whatever, whatever channel is showing the Celtics games. If the Celtics games were, again, I don't know if I could get all of them on this mega sports service, but I've got no interest in the other... 29 right. teams if they're not playing my local sports teams and his argument was like that's like you 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 know if, if you don't have the game that you want to watch you're not going to then use this service because who wants to watch you know a, a game of between two teams that you could care less about um so he made an interesting point on on that that it, it might be interesting from a business perspective but from the end user side he's just predicting like this is not gonna this is not gonna go really go anywhere right uh, and, and i'm the same way and I think that's probably it's probably the 80-20 rule or maybe the 90-10 rule. 20% or 10% of people want to watch every basketball game there is. Right. The rest of us want to watch our local teams. Right. And and, and if you're if you can't get your local teams, you're not going to subscribe to the to the, the sport channel. And the reason that, at least that I'm not. the reason that that 10% or 20% are are wanting to watch every game is because there's usually either a fantasy football or a fantasy sports or gambling involved in it. Right. Um, same reason when, when I go to the sports book at Vegas in Vegas, I'm not impressed by, by walking in there and seeing 40 different games on, you know, 40 TVs, 
because maybe none of the the games that are being shown are the ones that I'm interested in, unless I'm unless I've got money on it. Um, so right. maybe that's what that that equivalent is. Is it's 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 this giant sports book, but it's going to be in your it's going to be on the you know on your device here. Uh, all right, moving and, on and then, to yeah, go ahead. Anything else? I was going to say, and then the question is, how much are you, how much if you're that ten percent, how much are you willing to pay for? Depends on how well I'm uh, a gambler I am, I guess, <laughs> if I can afford yeah. it. Uh, all right, I want to jump to the the next story. Uh, I, I'm a little disappointed in this whole self driving car things, and uh, we talked about this on a, on a show last year where where we just felt that this whole industry was um, kind of stalling, and the technology like they've reached a technology plateau. Um, and now we're seeing, not only are we seeing uh, uh, companies that are now doing recalls. So, uh, you know, uh, a couple days ago, self-driving car company Waymo issued its first ever recall over a software issue after two of its cars in Phoenix collided with a pickup truck being towed backwards. But now people are fighting back. The, the big story over over uh, February 10th, Super Bowl weekend. I thought it was because of the Super Bowl, but this turns out that this this happened the day before the Super Bowl. So this was on Saturday night, February 10th, where a person jumped on the hood of a Waymo driverless taxi and smashed its windshield in San Francisco's Chinatown, uh, generating applause before a crowd formed around the car and covered it in spray paint, breaking its windows and ultimately setting it on fire. Uh, The fire department arrived minutes later, according to a report in the Autopian, but by then the flames had already fully engulfed the car. Um, it just, again, it feels San Francisco is having this like love hate relationship with self-driving cars. And if you can't get people in San Francisco to back something technology wise, then you've got no chance of going to any cities like in the Midwest or, um, and you know, I, I certainly wouldn't I mean, want to do this in New York or any places with snow. I mean, p- people may be finding them annoying because maybe during, you know, commuting hours, maybe they're. Right, they're slow. They maybe some of them will get stuck. I mean, we've seen other stories where some some of the driverless cars that they've been testing in San Francisco will drive into wet concrete. Yeah, they'll just you know. So I, I don't know. Maybe they did it out of frustration, or maybe they, maybe it's just because San Francisco. <laughs> I, I have no but, but idea. But if you can't but, like again to, to to if you can't make it there, you're not going to make it anywhere. To, to borrow oh, the New sure. York, the New oh. York New York song, but. Um, it's just not going to boil. Like, when did we hit this point where people aren't excited anymore? I like, I don't know. I don't even know if I want to get in one of these cars now. Just so my initial thinking on this whole. Like, tri- am I going to get attacked if I'm in a driverless car because some people in San Francisco don't like what I'm doing? Or, or it's not the I car. Have, it's not my fault. I'm I just have, riding. I have no idea, but I I, I can say I love I've, this. I love this video, by the way. I've driven in a driverless car in Singapore. Okay. Okay. In Singapore, and that was one of the leading, or not the leading, but one of the main uh, territories, countries that yeah. were um, testing driverless cars. Right. Now, why Singapore? Because they could in Singapore. It's a very small country. They had a lot of control over over you know their highways and stuff like that. Not a lot of people owned cars because they had a very big public transportation system. So, uh, trying to kick it off in a major you know, city like this. Yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised. You might just see more of these. Well, Singapore too, aren't they, aren't they relatively strict in their rules and discipline? Yes. Like they're, oh, yes. they're, they're the ones that will cane you if you're chewing gum or something like that. Oh or, yes. Yeah. Yes. But you know, and, and again, also not a lot of people drive in Singapore. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. very, it's very expensive to own a car in Singapore. I, I guess they have a well, lot of you know, like you know, tax laws. I, I think we've just gotten ahead of ourselves with this stuff, right? I mean, yeah. everyone's looking at, these driverless cars are something that are available today. And the fact is that most of them still suck. Yeah. I mean, look at all the problems that, that Tesla's having. Uh, and, and that's not even real. That's not even real self-driving technology. Right. Like that's, exactly. that's just like the auto assist or you're not supposed to keep, take your hands off during that stuff. You're supposed to be ready. That's right. In case something goes that's back. That's right. Yeah. Or, or, or wear a, an AR headset. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Don't do that <laughs> either. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, but, I think the biggest argument about about self-driving technology was we could get there tomorrow if we just banned driving from everybody. If, it's like couldn't isn't that true? Like maybe if if you didn't no. have or but I guess you'd have to ban pedestrians too, and you're never going to be able to do that either. You'd have to uh, ban. It's going to be humans doing buildings, human things. Trees, holes, streetlights. I mean, you have to <laughs> ban everything. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Maybe we'll get flying cars before we got a self-driving car. 
Well, they're already working on that. And yeah, well, but at least at least up in the air, you have fewer um, you have fewer idiots a, doing things out there. But you know, there's also the thing of falling and gravity that <laughs> terrify me. Uh, so, do you think that they make parachutes? Like, like, are we just at a plateau and it eventually it'll get better, or do you think that we're gonna that we should just give up on this idea? No, no, no. We're not going to give up on it. it it'll get better. Um, it, it's just that we're we're in many ways we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, there's a lot of work being done. If we, it's still three, four, maybe five years before we get real autonomous driving cars. It's not an easy problem to solve, and that's that's the trouble. People think it's just magic. It's not. It's a lot of hard work and a lot of computational power. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but just because it's, something it's is a, hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do, we shouldn't try it. it, it well, may... it, it's a it's a good idea generically if you think about it. Um, yeah, the goal. The, the goal, goal is. Yeah, the goal is to reduce you know traffic fatalities on right, highways. Right. Right. It, it's a very no ambitious goal. It's very. It's a. You know, I don't think anyone would disagree with trying to reduce the number of fatalities on the roads. Right. right, no one's going to say no. I guess we have to accept that. Sure, yeah, but then if they want to do that, just um, like when you walk into a car, have the whatever the computer in the car, sh you know, block your phone. Do that because I'm pretty sure that's, that's most of the accidents these days. It's just people looking at their cell phone, doing TikToks and stuff, and that's true. You know what I mean? Is that technology? Yeah, but then is, is it does exist. Yeah, does that exist, it does exist. Where you, I could step in my, and then I don't have any access to my phone at all. Well, it'll disable the, a lot of it. But is, is it kind of like the the breathalyzers that they get installed into the cars so that it, if if you if you're intoxicated you can't drive the car? Could they do that with the phone? I mean, where you can't drive if unless your phone is off. If we want, if if we want to go down that route, sure, they could implement that. <laughs> But. Well, most phones already have uh, an ability to be shut off if you're if you're moving, if you're driving. Yeah, right. But it's then it's also got. Well, I've also got Apple CarPlay where I plug in my phone and then it comes up on my little monitor right near my steering wheel. With mine, or at least with the Pixel, when you when it detects that you're driving, it will uh, go in driver mode. Right. So it'll basically mute, right. you know, block all of your notifications. But then you just you swipe up and you go, "I'm not driving." So you lie to you lie to the technology. Yeah. But but like that's just. It. But that's just like, you know, one piece of tech that I think is, okay, that makes a lot of sense, you know? Right. Yeah, but you know what the problem with that is? What what really gets people distracted is when they're using their phones for GPS. Yeah, right. true. Yeah. But I would... And that's well, everybody. Well, I still think GPS is a great, great technology. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It, it I helped, couldn't... Yeah. I can't live without it. But there's a lot of accidents caused by people, you know, reaching over the screen because the phone, you know, you're looking here and the phone's off to the side and you're you're trying to scroll through or whatever you're trying to do. There are a lot of accidents that happen because of that. Right. So what, do we ban GPS? Well, what, what's interesting so. is that GPS came out with, with remember they had, you know, yep. standalone, standalone devices. Right. And then a lot of car makers started putting it into the technology. But then somehow everyone was like, well, I'll just use it on my phone. And that created right. another problem because now you have to either have a mount or you plug it into CarPlay. Um, right. Well, the reason was because the car makers all charge three, four, five thousand dollars. They have a GPS display in their yeah. car, which was ridiculous. Right. So Who, who's going to pay that when it comes on your phone for free? That's right. We're going to blame the car makers. <laughs> sure. So why not? That's all I problem. They're all not right. here to defend themselves. <laughs> All right. Uh, the last stuff I want to talk about, there's some some ret uh, return to office stuff that I wanted to, to jump in on. And then there's one final story about work life that uh, I, I found interesting uh, in recent news. Uh, CNBC, again, had a story about uh, the CEO return to the office or else policy is having limited success in 2024. Um, it's a really long article that has a lot of key points in here, a lot of different um, things. I just want to go over some of them really quickly. First of all, um, a critical mass of workers are still ignoring return to office mandates. Uh, according to this article, uh, in some cases, companies are also finding it difficult to crack down on lower level employees because higher ups are also not complying. I found that pretty interesting that, you know, if you yep. have a return to office policy, but then your middle managers aren't following it, there's no way that your low, lower level manager or employees are going to are going to kind of fl flout it. Um, employees continue to want flexibility. Um, 
yeah, I, I, this is just really, really long. Um, I just think, it, it, just, just, just read the article in the show notes. I think it's really interesting. I want to jump to the next one. Sorry. Um, there, this whole return to office policy. Go to the Wall Street Journal one. The flu season, Chris. Okay, so the flu season that we're that we're going through right now, it's it's almost the end of winter. But um, it's now having an annoying side effect where people are now being sick shamed at work. Um, and the, the article starts off with one sign that your office life is officially back to normal. A colleague is coming to work, hacking up a lung and gets props for pushing through the illness. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it, spreading the wealth to everybody in the office. Yeah. And so it feels to me it's like, you know. You're, you're, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So, you know, you're trying to be a good employee and you're trying to follow whatever these hybrid work policies are, these return to office. But then you get sick and then you're like, well, if I don't go into work while I'm sick, then I'm going to get fired because I, I, I'm not following the return to office. But if I do come in and then I get everybody else sick, then I'm, then I'm a bad guy I'd, as well. I'd say, I'd say if your salary, take as much time as you want. If you're hourly and you don't have benefits... Maybe push through it. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, but I mean that, that always used to be I, again in the olden days. If you if you again depending on how many sick days you would get, you would only use them if you were really sick. But then the pendulum swang in this, this swang oh my, swung. <laughs> it's it's getting late. Uh, swung in the other direction, and then the companies were like, "Listen, if you got the sniffles, don't give it to the rest of us." And this was pre pre COVID. Um, and just stay at home. Uh, but but I, I feel that yeah. it's weird that like okay you, you're 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 telling everybody to get back into the office and we're back in the days of why are you coming in here if you're if you're hacking up along. Yeah, but there is one big difference that that we, we can't lose sight of, and that is that you know if you go back ten years ago or even, or especially twenty years ago, you couldn't get your job done from from home. Right. You had to go to work. Right. Today there are very few jobs. Well, if you're on the front it, line. It, yeah. Uh, you, okay. Fair. Right. Uh, or you know, you're a ditch digger, or you're a telephone pole repairman, or you're an electrician, or whatever. You you can't do that from your your desktop. Right. But for most knowledge based workers, you can get most of your job, if not all of your done, uh, all of your job done from a PC in your home if you have to. Right. And so that's part of the issue. The other part of the issue is, uh, and this has always been a big issue for me, is how well do you trust your workers? I mean, people who want office mandates, I can get uh, I get going saying you got to come in maybe one day a week or a couple of days a month just because you want the camaraderie, you want to meet your coworkers, you want to you know get that interaction. But if I work from midnight to 6 a.m. and get my job done, why do you care? Right. You know, it's it's done. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you're paying me to get a job done, not paying me to sit in my office for uh I'm starting. Yeah. I'm starting to feel like a lot of these articles that are coming out, what you know, or if it's research that that a company is is promoting or a survey or whatever, they, they they're always from that point of view that someone's got an agenda to push, um, and I and I get a sense that the Wall Street Journal is is like this. They they keep writing articles around this because so many of their clients or advertisers or supporters or yeah. audience are in that commercial real estate business. Yep. And so, yep. and there were, you know, so you say like, well, we've always got to report on office vacancies. It's like, again, when, when we talk about companies here, I think like for this company, for example, they're not, they're not, we're at, we're at a hybrid, but they're not forcing us to be in on a certain day. They're just like, Hey, try to come in two days a week or try to come in once. And, and they're very loosey goosey. Again, depends on your your role and your title and whether or not you can work at home. Again, like that whole general analogous of, of uh, knowledge worker. We do have right. IT department people that have to be here because again, if, if something goes down, you want to have the, them, uh, the ability to fix it for other people that come in or, or just remote kind of support. Um, and it feels like for most companies, they've probably solved this problem so that anything that you're hearing about now, it's just someone that's got an agenda to push. Um, All right. Maybe I should stop talking about this on the show, <laughs> Chris. I, and I know you have strong opinions about this. You think everybody should get back to work if they if they can, and because of the collaboration and the brainstorming, and for all those reasons, I think there should be more of a. I think there should be more of a middle ground. You know, I, I think uh, companies in general should should mandate 
some sort of return to office because I think uh, I think we're missing out on the the social interaction. But yeah, you but, know, you know, know what I don't like are these stories that are coming out. There's a lot been a lot of layoffs this year, and yep. it turns out that a majority of those layoffs are from people that were remote. Um, because I feel like maybe companies are feel that it's easier to let someone go bec- uh, remotely because you don't have to have you don't have to have them come in the office and it then is, tell them face to face. Um, like even with, even like I got laid off over the phone once, uh, right before COVID. I did too. Um, and, and it, you know, and I still despise the guy that did it to me. It was like, you don't have enough guts to come and have a cup of coffee with me to, to, to let me go. You have to do it over the cell phone. Like that annoyed the heck out of me. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think maybe, so that's, that's troublesome that they're doing this now with remote workers. I, I, I was on an international business trip and got a call. (laughs) <laughs> Jeez. And I got laid off. So, I, yeah. So I, mean, I knew I, what was coming, but well, still. One of my early jobs, I worked for a newspaper. Remember those things called newspapers, Jack? Um, uh, I think so. That's yeah. what we used to line our cages when we had birds <laughs> and stuff, right? Most of that stuff was probably written by me. Uh, I had a job <laughs> where the newspaper, we knew the newspaper was about to be shut down because you could always tell because there was very few ads in the newspaper. Um, and so, but then I went on vacation and visited my brother out in California. And I... I'm on vacation and I just gone to Fisherman's Wharf and spent a lot of money on stupid souvenir stuff. And the next morning, the, the, uh, I get a phone call from, cause I given the editor my number again, pre cell phones. Uh, so I'd given him my brother's number and he, and he calls me and says, Hey, when are you coming back? And I go, Oh, you know, I'm set to come back on Saturday. He's like, he goes, stay longer if you want. Cause you're, there's no job for you when you come back. And they shut down the entire paper. So it wasn't, I wasn't laid off, but they had basically closed the entire paper. Um, I can't remember the original point of my story, but that's... well, it's it's probably because you left. No, no, <laughs> I was a burden <laughs> on this newspaper. Trust me. <laughs> uh, all right, Jack. Again, thank you so much for being the guest co-host for the last four weeks. We'll definitely have you back on the show. You're you're great. You're great fun to talk to, and you've got a lot of great insights. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Keith. All right, that's all the time we have for today's episode. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, add any comments you have below. Join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.